Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And before we get into talking about today's topic, I'm very excited to say a massive thank you to Skillshare because they are sponsoring this video. And in fact, thank you to Skillshare for being the first to sponsor a video on this channel. Skillshare is an online learning platform that hosts thousands of classes from people who are willing to share their skills so you can develop yours. There are so many classes to choose from, you are sure to find something to take your fancy. I know I did. I'm willing to admit that since having my baby I have become a total mummy bore. I have never taken this many photos in my entire life. Of course, I want to try and make them as good as they can possibly be. So this week, I've been enjoying learning from Justin Bridges on the fundamentals of DSLR photography. Before now, I've only used my DSLR to record my videos for YouTube and also to take the selfies that I use for my thumbnails. I'm looking forward to doing Justin's intermediate course next. Skillshare is a creative and inspiring community. Skillshare is the place to keep you learning. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. The topic for this video, I would argue, is all the more fitting considering today's sponsor, because we are looking at a historical skill. A how-to guide, if you will. Albeit, it is for a skill that fortunately, for now at least, is rendered unnecessary. But we're exploring just how you escape from the dread fortress and prison of the Tower of London. John Gerard was born on the 4th of October 1564, which was almost six years to the day after the accession of Elizabeth I to the throne. He was born into a prominent and wealthy Northern Catholic family. John was his parents' second son. As such, according to the customs surrounding inheritance, it would be his elder brother who would be the one to inherit the family estates. John would follow an ancient custom, which saw many second sons who came from prominent families make their way in the world through entering the priesthood. Oral tradition holds that Elizabeth I had asserted that in matters of religion, she, quote, would not open windows into men's souls. Understandably, Elizabeth was keen to move away from the divisive and violent religious settlements of her siblings and her father. In 1559, Elizabeth's religious settlement was established. The Act of Supremacy made her supreme governor of the Church of England. Her father and brother had been head, but Perhaps her uterus got in the way. Alternatively, some have read it as an attempt to appease Roman Catholics, for whom, of course, the Pope was the head of the church. Maybe they'd be willing to accept Elizabeth as governor, if not head. In the same year, 1559, the Act of Uniformity came into force. For many, it represented a so-called middle way. There would be a uniform English prayer book, Church attendance would be a requirement on the Sabbath and other holy days, with recusancy resulting in a fine. But there were, in these services, echoes of a Roman Catholic past. There were candles, crosses and recognisable vestments. Loyal Roman Catholics could, in practice, attend Church of England services with their community without feeling they were totally denying their faith. Also, although officially prohibited, some could worship as their faith called them to in their homes, in secrecy and in private. So it seems that, at least at the start of her reign, it was thought plausible that a person might be both, loyal to their Protestant queen and also a secret, faithful Roman Catholic. As long as the former, their loyalty to Elizabeth, was not called into question by any of their behaviours, then the loyal Roman Catholic might hope that their faith would be studiously ignored by the powers that be. Spoiler alert, this would not always be the case. On the 25th of February, 1570, Pope Pius V 
published the Regnans in Excelsis, a bull which excommunicated Elizabeth. Now, any faithful Roman Catholic living in England was being instructed that Elizabeth was not their rightful queen, not deserving of their obedience, and more so, that they should seek to remove her from the throne. To make matters even worse, a potential Roman Catholic replacement was already in the country. Elizabeth's first cousin once removed, Mary Queen of Scots, who had arrived in England in 1568. Against this backdrop, John Gerard was receiving his education. It began at Exeter College, Oxford. He matriculated there on the 3rd of December 1575, when he was 11 years old. However, the following year, around Easter time, it seems that his refusal to attend church services, presumably Church of England services, resulted in him leaving the university and returning to his home. His education, however, was not over, because a couple of months before his 13th birthday, in August 1577, he was on the continent, seeking to continue his education in a Roman Catholic setting. He would follow the English college, which was a Catholic seminary, to Reims. He would transfer to the Jesuit Collège de Clermont in Paris in 1580. But apparently a bout of ill health caused Gerard to have to leave after about a year there. But by late 1581, he was making moves to join the Society of Jesus to become a Jesuit himself. Records show that Gerard was back in England by early 1583, because at this point he was captured and placed in the custody of a family member, thought by many to be his mother's brother, George Hastings. Unfortunately, Gerard seems to have proved obstinate in his refusal to conform to the religious requirements of Elizabethan England. Eventually, family custody would not seem to be enough. He would ultimately be transferred to the Marshalsea Prison on the 5th of March, 1584. Gerard would be bailed out, to use a contemporary term. The old term would be given surety by some supporters. One of these supporters was Anthony Babington, whose name I'm sure rings bells for many of you, because in the near future, after this event, he will be caught plotting with Mary Queen of Scots. For this crime and his part in it, he will lose everything including his head. Gerard's supporters may all have approved the next move to be taken by their man, even though it ensured they lost their money. Because Gerard absconds. He leaves for France in 1586. John Gerard returned to continue his education at the English College on the continent. He would be ordained on the 17th of July 1588 using a papal dispensation, because he had not yet reached the required canonical age to be ordained. Of course, 1588 is significant for another reason. It was the year that the Spanish Armada threatened to invade English soil, and with that invasion was threatened a violent forced return to the Roman Catholic faith. In essence, England was being threatened with Inquisition. John Gerard became a Jesuit, entering the Society of Jesus on the 15th of August, 1588. His next journey would take him back to England to fulfil the mission of the Society of Jesus. Just what that mission actually was continues to be debated. For some, the mission was simply to provide religious succour for the Roman Catholic faithful who would otherwise have been cast adrift by their nation's Protestant heresy. Others claimed that the Jesuits were tasked with spreading dissent, fermenting rebellion, and even acting as a direct threat to the life of Elizabeth I. In 1585, Elizabeth's government issued an act against Jesuits, seminary priests, and other such like disobedient persons, by which these persons were given 40 days to leave the country, or face capture and execution. Those who chose to invite, host, or hide these people were in danger of suffering in likewise fashion. Despite this threat, Father John Gerard had a calling to answer. After his ordination and entry into the Society of Jesus, he went to work, 
in a number of homes of the Roman Catholic gentry in England. But make no mistake, the stakes could not have been higher. Gerard and his ilk were being hunted. Catholic homes across the country had contained priest holes for a number of years. Construction had begun, we think, in as early as 1550. However, I imagine that they felt somewhat different after the 1570 excommunication, and even more so after that 1585 act. Nevertheless, Father Gerard would remain at large for a few years, able to fulfil his mission and perform his ministry. He was eventually captured in London on the 23rd of April, 1594. At first, he was held in a prison called the Counter. From there, he was moved to the Clink, where he continued to perform his calling as a Roman Catholic priest. In 1597, he was moved to the Tower of London, specifically to a cell in the Salt Tower. One of his predecessors in this tower was another Jesuit, Henry Walpole. Walpole had been executed, or martyred, depending on your point of view, in 1595. Apparently, this fate, this horror, did not fill Gerard himself with dread. Quite the opposite. It seems that it made him resolute. Gerard recounted that he was taken to a secret underground chamber, where he was tortured, in the hopes that he would disclose the location of his co-conspirators and co-religionists in particular, Father Henry Garnet. Gerard would be hung in manacles for hours at a time. Being suspended by the wrists in metal cuffs is spectacularly unpleasant. Having one's full body weight concentrated on the wrists for hours puts strain on the ligaments of the arms and shoulders. Also, permanent damage to the wrists and hands was a common result, including permanent nerve damage. And that fact is going to be important in a bit, so do store it away. Father John Gerard did not break under these conditions, and he kept his secrets and his confidences. More so, he was able to have the mental fortitude to find a way to save himself and escape the Tower of London. But how on earth did he do that? Gerard's version of events is that he was able to convince, I think Reed Bribe, his warder or jailer to buy him oranges and bring them in. Gerard said he claimed that he was going to use these oranges to assist him in exercising his tortured hands, a kind of early modern physiotherapy for the condemned, if you will. Gerard said that he used a knife to cut the peel of the oranges into crosses so that he could place those crosses onto a silk thread and make rosaries. He asked for paper to wrap his rosaries so that he could send them as gifts to his fellow prisoners. Additionally, he requested a feather quill be brought to him so he could pick and clean his teeth. So, Gerard had managed to amass oranges, paper and a quill feather. Wonderful. How on earth do these unusual items manage to get you out of the dread fortress of the Tower of London? Well, it turns out that you sharpen the quill feather to make a writing implement. You also take the time to store up orange juice, with which you write on your paper. Once dry, this orange juice is invisible ink. It will only become visible again when it's held over a flame and heated up. You can write an inoffensive letter over the top of this invisible missive, something that a jailer would take absolutely no issue with carrying to someone's friends. Of course, another fee would be involved. In this way, apparently, John Gerard was able to plan his escape with his friends. Now, the Salt Tower is on the inner wall of the fortress. Opposite, on the outer wall, was the Cradle Tower. Helpfully held there at the same time as Gerard was another Catholic prisoner one John Arden. Gerard's trusty, bought slash bribed jailer was willing to take his prisoner to the Cradle Tower to have a visit so that these two men could share mass together. Again, of course, we are told that a fee was involved. On the 5th of October 1597, under cover of darkness, 
Gerard and Arden made their way up onto the roof of the cradle tower in secrecy. There, they waited for their escape party. That party arrived with a small boat and they would then go on to follow the plans that were sketched out in the orange juice letters. Gerard and Arden would let down a cord to which a rope could be tied and then drawn up. And so it was. With this achieved, the rope was secured so that it would allow their escape. This was, of course, not without considerable effort and risk. Indeed, we are informed that the escape was only really made possible by prayer. Nevertheless, the two men were able to travel off the tower roof of the cradle tower, go over the moat and then over the opposite wall in order to land on the wharf where their escape boat waited. It worked. Father John Gerard remained in England, ministering in hiding to his Roman Catholic flock until the 3rd of May 1606, at which point he was recalled to the continent to help train other Jesuits. In 1609, John Gerard sits down to write his autobiography, which is where we get the details of his imprisonment, of his torture, the one that failed to make him name names, and of how he undertook his daring escape. Father John Gerard would live to be 73 years old. He died in 1637 at the English College Seminary in Rome. He also died as the hero who would put his faith in his Roman Catholic God, which had enabled him to escape the murderous heretics of Elizabeth's Protestant England. And sure, it's a great story. I bet the Jesuits and the Pope absolutely loved it. But do we, today, actually buy it? This man, who was tortured so badly, he was able to convince or bribe his jailer to bring him oranges as a means of rehabilitation. This is a man who we are being asked to believe was able to hand over fist it along metres of rope, on his hands alone, in the darkness. I think it's more plausible that we might argue that a man who admits to having the capacity to bribe jailers to bring him oranges, which apparently he is also able to afford, not only that, he additionally gets him to carry letters and organise dinner parties, sleepovers and prayer meetings on his behalf, isn't it plausible, arguably more plausible, that this man would be able to bribe that same jailer to just open the gates, to let him and his friend out. Perhaps, being kind, it's not simply bribery. Maybe the jailer was a fellow crypto-Roman Catholic who acted on their faith. Maybe Gerard managed to convert them while they were being his jailer. Did Gerard create a lie? Not only to boost his own profile, but perhaps to protect the person who risked it all to help him escape certain death. But what do you think? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. Or you can find me over on my social media. I'll leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then why not share it with your friends? Also, let me know by hitting the thumbs up and why not subscribe to this channel? And while you're there, also hit the little notification bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.